are ready in the house of the Lord today. Oh man, if you just stand with me across this auditorium. I believe that God would do a wonderful work among us today. I feel like God wants to visit us today and take care of some situations that we deal with on a daily basis that inhibit us from being completely what he wants us to be. How many of you know what I'm saying, know what I mean when I say sometimes we feel bound up in spirit. You see, God loves us so much. And uh, Brother Keith, it's his desire for there to be a liberty in our spirit when we approach him. God's desire, how many of you believe God have a desire for the service today? I talked to the prayer group last night. How many believe that God has a a divine desire for the church today. Well, if look at your neighbor and tell him I'm part of the church. That means that he's got a divine purpose for you today. It's so easy sometimes to read ourselves out of scripture, but it's important that we put ourselves in the will of God. God has a divine purpose for you today. Now, there is one thing that keeps us out of the presence of God. It's condemnation. Sin doesn't keep us out of the presence of God. Sin's the a, sin's a reason we run to God. There is no sin that concerns, uh, should I say, back up. There's no sin that is too big for God. There's no sin that will keep you. God, that will cause God to reject you. One drop of blood. However, when we come into the presence of God in such a service like this, and people are praying and worshiping, and we can look at them when we say, my goodness, I, I, it condemns us sometimes in our own spirit that Brother Atkins can flow so easily into the Holy Ghost and I struggle so much. That's not the will of God. That's not the will of God for you to come and hear these brothers and sisters praying or to watch somebody else get blessed in service and you leave without the touch of God that you need for that day. That's not the will of God. But when we come into the presence of God, Brother Miguel, sometimes it's We feel rejected. We feel this shame. It's nothing. That's, I guess that's how it's supposed to work. Now, don't, don't jump ahead of me. There's this prophet named Isaiah, incredible man of God. We have all kinds of things that he tells Israel. And then we get to chapter 6 of the book that he wrote, and he said, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. I saw the magnificence of God. And then he came to the, through a vision or whatever, he came into the temple and he saw the angels as they began to worship and glorify God. And all was well and good, coming to church and going through everything. Brother Ralph, until the Bible says, and the glory of God, like a cloud, came into the room. And as soon as the presence of God came in the room, Bishop, he said, woe is me. Everything was good. Everything was great. Music was going. The worship team was doing a wonderful job. But there's something about the presence of God. It is the light of his glory that begins to shine light. And, oh, thank God for the light until, oh, my garments are spotted. The Lord didn't miss a beat. Isn't God amazing? Isn't God merciful and wonderful? The angel flew from the altar, took a coal from the altar and touched his lips. Let me tell you what, once you've bypassed the altar, right after that, we hear this, whoa, this man of unclean lips. 
saying, here am I, send me. One touch from the altar changes our perspective. We see ourselves through the glory of Jesus Christ and not through the righteousness of our unrighteousness of our own selves. So today I know that the Lord would like to do a wonderful thing among us, but it's important for us first. I, talk, I took the prayer group last night through the Old Testament tabernacle, and I would like for us to go there. Pastor, we've got to get service underway. It's, it's no sense in getting service under the way. If once we get in the presence of God, we have to back up. Let's just go about this right off the bat, the right way. And then when they come and lead worship, Brother Rushing walks up here and sings one of them goofy songs that I don't like. My, I'm going to like today. Thank you. I, my spirit is right. I have no condemnation. I have no shame. How does that happen, Pastor? I don't know. But one visit. One visit past the altar erases sin and shame. And the man that says, God, I can't come into your presence because of, God says, let me take care of that. And in the next moment, the touch of God happens in our life. And we find ourselves saying, you know, God, by your glory and by your righteousness, I can do all things. So everyone here has opportunity to thank God for something. We all need to be thankful. Enter into his gates of thanksgiving into his courts with praise. So would you, I'm not going to say quickly, would you thoughtfully begin to thank God for the breath that you just took? Life may be going downhill. That's okay. You're in the presence of God. He can change that in a moment. But as long as there's life, there's hope. Would you begin to thank God for his goodness? God, I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy that found me and loved me in spite of who and what I was. God, I am undeserving of the least of your blessings. I'm so undeserving of the blood that you shed. I don't know why you love me. God, I don't know why you sacrificed your life for me, but I'm so grateful. I am so thankful that you did. God, the voices, the song says of a million angels couldn't express my gratitude for what you've done. I am so grateful. I am so thankful. God, only you know where I would be without your grace and mercy. Only you know the path that my feet would have taken if you had not been there and loved me. Thank you, God. Thank you, God. Thank you for meeting with us today. Thank you for your purpose for this service today. Thank you for wooing us and calling us to a, to a place by your side today. Okay, now I want you to lift your hands and your heart to heaven and begin to praise God for what he's done. God, I praise you for your glorious works. I praise you, oh God, for the magnificent works that you've done. God, yes, the creation and all that there is that goes with this life. But beyond that, I thank you for a new covenant. I thank you for Calvary, whereby, Lord, you opened a way to a Gentile world to be a part of who you are. I praise you, God, that you can take that which is dead and trespasses and sin and can revive it by the power of your spirit and make it something glorious in your heavenly kingdom I thank you God I praise you Lord I worship you Jesus I praise you for the works oh God of Gethsemane of the of the, of the whipping post of the cross I praise you God for an open tomb I praise you for the power of the resurrection that enables us to live a life above sin beyond Lord the draw of lust and temptation in the 
world. I praise you, God, for the power that you placed within your body. Oh, God, you are worthy to be praised. I praise you for the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, everything in heaven and earth and under the earth must come to the obedience to. I praise you for the power of the name that is called over us in waters of baptism and our sins are washed away. I praise you for the blood that was shed for our healing of mind, soul, as well as body. I praise you, God. Hallelujah. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. You're worthy. And since he's so worthy and we in our flesh are not, it's imperative that we walk to the altar where the sacrifice was made. In the Old Testament, there was that sacrifice that they offered up the lamb, the sacrificial lamb for the sin of those that would bring it, put their hand on its head and say, God, this is our priest, this is my sin, this is my confession, and it's offered up. Well, Jesus Christ became that sacrificial lamb, but it's just as important that you and I walk by Calvary. And we say, God, that was my sin that nailed you to that rugged cross. I don't know where you are today. I don't know what your life consists of. I don't know what you struggle with. But I know that Jesus Christ died for every sin. Sins of commission. And sometimes we as, let me just say, born again believers have more sins of omission than commission. Seems like every time I go to God in prayer, I ask God, forgive me for not being spiritually minded enough. Forgive me for not fellowship in your presence enough. What's enough, Brother Rob? I don't know, but I know I don't do it enough. So could we thoughtfully stop by this altar of sacrifice? And then when you're done there, it's important to ask God to wash you with his blood. Because as long as I'm forgiven, that's okay with God to me. But I need to be washed so I'm okay with me to God. That Anybody know what I'm talking about? Shame. You ever do something wrong and ask somebody to forgive you? And they say, sure, I forgive you, but you still feel wretched on the inside. That, there's no more sin there. It's just shame. That's what the blood's for. So quickly, in your mind not necessarily in your heart. I'm, I'll just omit the word quickly. That sounds too casual. Could we just stop by that altar? God, thank you for your blood that you shed. I thank you for Calvary, an opportunity, a place for me to stop. God, I'm so grateful for what you've done, and I praise you for who you are and your worth. But God, I'm unworthy. I am so unworthy. Without your blood that was shed, God, I'm nothing. God, I ask that you would forgive me for everything that I've thought, said, done, or haven't done that has offended you or hurt you. God, I'm sorry. I don't want to live an unrighteous life. I want to come into your presence with clean hands, uh, with a clean heart. Create within me a clean heart. Oh, God, renew a right spirit within me. Lord Jesus, I don't want to come into your presence with condemnation. I don't want to come into your presence with a, gar a garment that's spotted by sin and, and failures in my own life. So I stop by this cross where you paid the price for my indiscretions and my inabilities to be holy. And God, I avail myself of this opportunity to ask you, forgive me, Jesus. I repent, oh God. Forgive me. And Lord, and while you're at it, would you just wash me in your blood that you shed? 
Lord, you said, come and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet. Uh, oh, come on. Uh, you said they would be white. I don't know how uh, you wash uh, this heart with your blood and make it pure. Uh, but God, would you do it? Uh, that there be no sin. Uh, that there be no condemnation. Uh, that there be a freedom, a liberty. When I come into your presence, I can lift up holy hands and feel your presence uh, without shame. Thank you, Jesus. Now I want you to ask God. The rest of it, if you followed this up to now, is up to Jesus. As we enter into the remainder of this service, I want you to walk through, as it were, in your mind into that holy place. With the candles on one side casting the light of revelation, the bread re representing the word of God. So that we can see and understand. Would you ask God, God, open the eyes of my understanding today. God, speak to me, reveal to me your love, your word, and your purpose. God, without you I can do nothing. Your ways are so far above ours. God, it's a spiritual work that you do in this fleshly body, but I cannot perceive it in the flesh. Your word says that it's, it's ignorant. I, I'm ignorant of that, God, and it's impossible for me to perceive spiritual things through this natural mind. So, God, enlighten us today. Hallelujah. Let the glory of your presence come into this place and shine your light of revelation. What do you want to do in my life? What do you want to do in this house? Come on, ask God. What do you want to do in my life today? God, what is your purpose in me this day? I know you've got a divine purpose for this church. God, I am part of the church. I am part of the blood-bought bride. I am yours, O oh Lord. Reveal to me. Make me sensitive, oh God, to your movings this day. God, I've asked you to forgive me. You've washed me. I stand before you not in my own righteousness, but oh God, through you, through your righteousness. Now, God, reveal your work. Reveal your way. Reveal your love. Reveal your purpose in our lives today. And visit this vineyard, I ask, oh God. Visit this vineyard, I ask, oh God. Let your spirit minister among us. Loose, oh Lord God, the ministry gifts of the body. Let them work among us, we ask. Heal, deliver, give, oh God, revelation and understanding. Pour out your spirit among us, we pray. In the holy name of Jesus, would you just keep an atmosphere of worship until God just translates us into that holiest of holy place where he does the work. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Yes, we lift you up, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes. Oh, hallelujah with my whole heart. I sing, Lord, I bless your name. Hallelujah, Lord. We worship you, Jesus. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, wake my soul today. Have your way, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, when I close my eyes. I can see your glory when I raise, raise my hands. I can touch your face when I bow my knees. I stand before you and Christ is formed in me. Awake my soul.
myself when I lose myself I reflect your image when I break break my will then I am whole when I kill God I give you everything right now holding nothing back Lord here I am Jesus have your way have your way surrender to you then Christ is for oh yes awake my soul awake my soul prepare an entrance for your glory and let my heart oh prepare created me a clean heart need your Holy Spirit more than When I lift my voice, hallelujah, when I surrender myself to you, then Christ is born in me. When I let go and I let you be God, then Christ is born in me. Hallelujah. Can you lift your hands to heaven right now? Have your way, Jesus. I worship you. I surrender to you. There's no God like you. You're the everlasting God. Come on, he doesn't grow weary. He doesn't faint. Hallelujah. You can find your seats. You can continue to worship. Jesus, we worship you. Hallelujah. Oh, you are not a God. God dependent on any mortal man. You are not a God in need of anything. Come on, you're sovereign. Oh yes, that's just the way. You are not a God. You are not a God created by human hands. You are not a God dependent on any mortal figured out I trust you Lord oh yeah you are God alone you're the only God whose power none can contend you're the only God whose name and praise will never end you're the only God who's worthy of everything we can give you are God, that's just the way it is, yes, and you 
our God alone from before time began. You are on your throne. We worship you, Lord. Oh, yes. And right now, in the good times and bad, you are on your throne. You are God alone. You're unchangeable, unshakable, unstoppable. That's who you are. That's the God I serve. Unchangeable, my faith. Oh, the everlasting God. That's who you are. Oh, you're unchangeable, unshakable. Unstoppable, that's who you are. You are God alone from before time began. He's got it all figured out. Oh, you are God alone. And right now, in the good times and bad, you are still on your throne. And I'm going to worship you. Unshakable, hallelujah. I give glory to your wonderful name. Your unchanging glory. Yes, your unchanging power. You are worthy yesterday, today, and forever, Lord. Oh, you're unchangeable, unshakable. Unstoppable, that's who you are. Hallelujah. And we worship you. Hallelujah. As the unmutable, unchanging, unaltering God, sovereign. Hallelujah. We worship you, Lord. Right now. to be in the house of the Lord today. Pastor gave us a little inkling in prayer last night. Church wasn't going to be normal today. All that spirit of expectation has been percolating in me the last since that time. I'm looking forward to service today. You may be seated in Jesus' name. Jesus never gives up. How many of you have ever failed before? <laughs> Every hand's going to be up, right? And Jesus still keeps planting that seed of truth, that seed of love. Hoping that we will receive it. He's not hoping that what he's giving out is good stuff. He's hoping I will recognize it. Say, I'm tired of this old life. I'm looking for something that will last. <laughs> In Matthew 13, it's that parable of the sower and the soils. Man, I forgot my Bible. And then Matthew 13, 23, it's talking about that soil that we all want to be. But he that receives seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word and understandeth it, which also beareth fruit and bringeth forth fruit, some to a hundredfold, some to sixty, and some to thirty. His seed is going to be healthy. It's going to be vigorous. It's going to work. It's dependent upon us to end up receiving it. I remember hearing the story of Bishop's Christian heritage and history since I was a young child. It's always interested me. We talked about his grandparents and his great-grandparents. And I'm sure there's people who was casting seed. Men of God who stood up and was preaching the word at that time. And yet his grandparents didn't receive it. And then along comes his mother who was some good ground. And who received that soil. And he talked about as a young child going in a church bringing him in. And they was planting seed. They was planting anointed seed of God's word into his life. And look how it has prospered and it's grown. Every one of you who's here, pastor for the Lashley, sister deed, the rest of the congregation, a part of that harvest that continues when good soil. Bishop's mother says, hey, I will be receiving of this. I'm going to plant that here and let it end up growing. 
How many of you came to God on your own without anybody else witnessing to you? And there could be some. I mean, through the Word of God, you could do that. I get it. But I'm taking by no show of hands. Every one of you was touched by somebody else who is willing to sow into your life who is willing to plant some seed of truth. How many of you can remember a teacher or somebody in position of authority who loved you, who cared for you along the way? <laughs> That's the love of God in action. I remember Pastor Lashley, John Lashley, talking about a Bible that he still has that has Sunday school teachers' names in the front. Why? Because they took the time to pull their money and invest that into them. Some of you as my Sunday school teachers, investing seed. I have a picture of my Bible with the same thing in it. What a beautiful opportunity to share the love of God with other people. And I'm bringing you to a need. Our two to three year old Sunday school class has a need for teachers who would step up and plant some more seed into children's life. Life everlasting. These are people who are going to be in a position of leadership at one point. It's easy to look at a two and three year old and not recognize that. But how many of you is ever two or three years old? And look where you're at now because somebody else invested in you and cared for you. I'd ask you to be praying about this. Brother Clousing and I and other teachers have already been praying that in this service today, God would put that burden in those of your hearts because we need it to start almost immediately, maybe even immediately. The two to threes on Wednesday nights, if you'd be willing to step into that, and I don't want everybody to volunteer if you don't feel any sort of burden for it, but if you feel the calling of God throughout the service today, would you please see Brother Clousing? You don't have to be the greatest teacher. You just have to be willing to say, God, I'll step out here and I'll help plant some of that seed of your truth and then expect God to multiply that good to you. Because it's not just the children that's going to be blessed. You're going to be blessed as you invest into their lives. Ushers, if you'll come and receive the tithe and offering, let's God ask God to anoint that and to anoint this service. Every one of us can leave here today changed closer to God than we currently are through his great love. Jesus, we thank you for your beautiful presence that is in this place, for that spirit of expectancy, that spirit of faith. I ask you to loosen to us even greater faith. Help us to enter easily into your presence today. Anoint this tithe and offering as we give it back to you. Anoint this worship service as we enter into your praise. In Jesus' name, amen.
somebody sing hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. We praise your name. Praise to the only living God. Praise to the holy faithful one. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness. There is freedom. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for the power of your spirit. you come we praise your name there is freedom to dance in your presence freedom to walk in liberty hallelujah we praise your name somebody sing hallelujah oh thank you jesus i magnify your name i praise you Thank you, Lord, that you saved me, that you filled me with the baptism of the Holy Ghost, that I could feel your presence, your power, the liberty. Oh, hallelujah. So I could shout, hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. I can shout from the depths of my soul. We praise your name.
Oh, you should have been there when I prayed through. You should have felt what I felt. Ah, come on. Brother Kenny, they should have drugged their carcass out of bed at 12 o'clock in the morning when you came down and prayed through. It was sleepy night, but oh, what a heavenly delight when God got a hold of you. Change your soul. Ah. Here's a good one for you. Sister Terry. Can I, can I tell that night? She went to a regular corner looking for drugs. And somebody had the audacity to have a tent meeting on her corner. She said, I got ticked off. I was looking around for my drug dealer and some lady full of the Holy Ghost, pulled the door open and said, hey, we're having a revival. Why don't you come join us? She said, not on your life. So when she got to the front, she said, I thought I'll sneak out in a minute. She said, no way. That Holy Ghost sister plopped her carcass right behind me. And every time the preacher preached, she was right with him. She said, the Holy Ghost got a hold of me. And God filled me with the baptism of the Holy Ghost. You should have been there that night. Come on. Come on. Can you remember the pit where God found you? Praise God. One of, these, one of these nights, I'm going to have her tell her testimony. I told Brother Adkins, I said, if you're having trouble getting the Holy Ghost, just try to keep up with the words of these songs. I've been sweating just listening. Amen. Are you happy to be in the house of God? I was glad when they said unto me, hey, let's go to church. Because I know that where two or three are gathered together in his name, he is there personally. He is there in person. He is there in power right in the midst of us. I don't know what you have need of today, but I know there are as many needs in this auditorium as there are people. And my God, shall supply all of your need. Look at your neighbor and say, that's all of it. According to his riches and glory. Ah. Man, we could have just had a praise break there for a minute. You know, it don't hurt you every once in a while just to turn loose. How many of you used to dance whenever you're in the world? Put them hands back up. Sister Betty, are you serious? How many of you know dancing is not something spiritually done? Oh, I was dancing in the spirit. Hogwash. That's another act of holiness. Holiness is simply worship. A lifestyle of worship. Brother Matthew said, you mean you didn't dance? You've been raised, have you been dancing in the church is what I want to know. <laughs> been raised in the church all his life. Praise God. I bet you danced when she said, I do. Or I will. <laughs> Oh, praise God. Do you know that's a command? Go back and read Psalms 150. So, oh, Pastor, we're much more sophisticated than that. Jesus wasn't. 
when they told him the wonderful works that he, they had done in his name, the scripture says, no music, nothing going on. All of a sudden, just a spirit of, of gratitude and worship came over the Lord Jesus. And the Bible says right out there in the middle of everything, he just dropped his all and began to dance. Well, if it's good enough for him, it's good enough for me. How about you? And if you used to dance in the world, folks, listen, we, t we worship by our cultures. I was in Africa, in South Africa. That is a dancing, dancing bunch of people in the church and out of the church. And as long as it doesn't, isn't vulgar or bring praise to the individual, my God, do it unto the Lord. He's worthy. Amen. Dancing was to be done before the Lord long before it was to be done for entertainment. Okay. Don't let the devil steal your dance. I said, don't let the devil steal your dance. Don't let your pride do it either. Aunt Mary, I know you used to because you taught me the Charleston. Oh, I didn't know you danced before the Lord because when I was young, I used to dodge, dodge all y'all's bobby pins and high heels. I mean, it wasn't a good service if there wasn't bobby pins laying around. Anybody remember those days? No, yeah. oh, we're too sophisticated for that. Let me tell you what, when the Holy Ghost gets a hold of you. And you let go of you. There's no telling what will happen. Don't worry about what will keep you. The Bible says let everything be done decently in order. Them big bouncers that stand around their ushers, they, they won't let you hurt yourself or nobody else. I will ask you this, okay? I said this a long time ago. There used to, like I said, there used to be this old saying that, oh, I was dancing in the spirit. And I understand we dance under the influence of the Holy Ghost. But this church is small enough. Would you please dance with your eyes open? Oh, I was dancing. If you can't dance in the spirit with your eyes closed and not hit nobody, you're not in the spirit. Well, honey, I am not in the spirit. You hear me? And you don't want my 200 plus bouncing into you or one of our little chillings. Ah, just a little bit of instruction and in righteousness. It's not hurting anything. Don't worry about it. Well, Pastor, I can't dance very good. Who, who are you trying to please? Who are you trying to please? I am the most uncoordinated person besides the bishop you ever met in your life. Matthew chapter 5. I want to talk to you today about converted worship for just a little while. I believe that the Lord wants to do something in this place today. I believe that the Holy Prince, Sister, uh, Sister uh, Grant, don't go too far. I don't know what would hold you back. I don't know what would plague your mind and keep you from giving yourself in a total abandonment to the only one that can save you. But I'm telling you, the enemy will use anything possible to distract us, to distract our worship. Mark chapter 5, verse 5 and 6, let me simply say, I am equating no one with the demoniac today, okay? Quit looking at your spouse. I am not equating anyone with, demo with the demoniac of Gadara today. I'm simply using this story as a foundation. Always. Everyone say always. Do you ever feel like you just can't get loose of something? Have some good days when you lay your head on your pillow at night. 
Notice it says night and day. It seemed like the night always came before the day. He was in the mountains and in the tombs. Bishop, these next two words hit me in the heart every time I read them, crying out. I said, God, how many times do I find myself lost in the tombs of my own broken dreams, my own broken future, crying out, God, how? God, why? God, when? Crying out and cutting himself with stones. I would like to label... This portion of the scripture, involuntary worship. Verse 6 doesn't leave us there, though. It's like the day at the end of a long night. When he saw Jesus, I love that next verse. From afar. It takes me back to the prodigal son. The father saw him afar off. Oh, one of these days I may preach a message. Seeing from afar. He ran and worshipped him. Now that, brothers and sisters, was a voluntary worship. That was a decision to worship. That was a decision to bring all my junk. Not because I'm unworthy, but because he's worthy. Forgetting who and what I am in the light of who he is. Oh, I wish we could do that. Oh, I wish we could do that. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. Now, I know we know the second verse, 17, but let's grab a hold of 16 before we jump ahead to the good stuff, all right? Because there's a key here. Nevertheless, everybody read this next phrase. When one turns to the Lord. When one turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Now. <laughs> Everyone say that word with me. Now. When. When. When does it happen? When the veil is taken away. Well, when does that happen? When I turn to the Lord. Now, the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is. When one turns to the Lord, there's liberty. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You put your Bibles down one more time. Raise your hands to heaven and thank God for his word and ask him to open the eyes of our understanding and visit us today. God, we love you. Thank you so much for your word. God, I can't do this on my own. In fact, I can't do it at all. Anything that is done today is going to be done through your power. Hallelujah. Now, I ask God that you would anoint the remainder of this service. We have come to you in worship and praise and adoration. Now, God, we need you. We need you. Use your word, O oh God, and transform us today, I pray, in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. And everyone said amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. It's always been in the heart of humanity to worship. We are worshipers. God placed that need within us so we would seek Him out of a desire to find something other than ourselves for sufficiency. You see, worship, brothers and sisters, is a reverent honor or homage paid to God or any sacred personage or object. It doesn't have to be relegated only to the one true and living God. Worship is a feeling and adoring sense of reverence and or regard so while in today america 
most of us wouldn't consider ourselves worshiping an idol. We are still worshipers in a sense. We worship in various forms and fashions. I'm not talking about just the church. I'm talking about society as a whole. We worship in various forms and fashions. But in reality, anything that takes the place of God becomes an idol worship. This is Satan's goal, whether it's in a, a continent of Africa, South America, India, uh, the, the country of India, Pakistan. It doesn't matter where it But as long as the enemy can get us to change the object of our adoration, he has changed our worship from the one true and living God to an idol worship. It doesn't matter what name we call it. Whenever it takes the place of God, holding that first place in mind and soul, you and I, humanity, becomes a Bound by idol worship. For some, it's a career. Pleasure. Sports. Entertainment. A relationship. Or even success. And some people jump right on the bandwagon and say, Amen. But for others of us, it's a misfortune. It's a frustration. It might be a pain that holds a place of mental and emotional control over us. And it's still, brothers and sisters, worship because it is the object that we focus our attention and life upon. Regardless of the nature, it still leaves us unsatisfied. It still leaves us hopelessly and helplessly bound to uncontrollable factors. Since there's a God of this world that specializes in isolating humanity from God and from the hope of God. Like the man in our text, we find ourselves aimlessly wandering through our own cemeteries. Haunted by dead hopes and dead dreams and dead futures. Now, since worship is what we revere, and that word means fear as well as awe, Satan tricks us at times into bondage of becoming worshipers of our own failures, our own shame, our own shortcomings. If you need a title for today... You just stamp that one on it. Converted worship. Converted worship. Satan counts on you and I so focusing on the dead issues of our lives that we can't even see hope when it arrives. And let me tell you, my brother, sister, my friend, hope will arrive. I said, hope will arrive. I don't care how black the night. I don't care how dark the skies. I don't care how low the clouds may hang. I don't care how bad the thunderstorm. It cannot hold back the light of day. When the sun begins to rise, honey, it's going to shine again. There's going to be light again. Titus 2 and 11, a very familiar passage of scripture. I love it. The grace of God, the goodness of God, the blessings of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. God literally went through hell to get to you and I today. You see, after his death, he took the keys of death, hell, and the grave so that you and I may be able to receive his might, the extended freedom from this bondage that every one of us carry in some way or another. Jesus Christ defeated demonic forces so you and I wouldn't have to be bound by fears, tormented, diseased, nor addicted. You see, he suffered in his body and soul that you and I could have freedom, a freedom impossible by human effort to gain, or you and I would have it already. 
A freedom that was impossible for me to gain. Yeah, I'm a converted worshiper. I said, yes, I'm a converted worshiper. I'm also a recovering doubter. Come on, I know what it's like to believe that God can use anybody else except me. I know what it's like to think, yeah, God loves the whole world except Jeffrey. I know what it's like to stand with my shame keeping me out of the presence of God. But let me tell you something. I also know what it's like to open up my heart and say, God, I know you love me because your word says it. I know you'll have mercy because your word says it. I know your spirit is able to quicken me because your word says it. God, I'm going to be a worshiper. I'm going to turn my eyes away from my failure. And I'm going to look, oh God, to your mercy, to your grace, to your power. I'm going to be a converted worshiper. I'm not going to face my fears anymore. I'm not going to allow my failures to hold me shackled. I'm going to look to the power of God that resides inside of me. And I'm going to focus upon that. Oh, I wish somebody would do that today. Pastor, I'm just not that kind of a person. I'm just not that anointed. I'm just not that powerful. Why not? You can be. I said we can be. You see, Jesus didn't just show up on a distant shore by accident and be taken by surprise by some deranged lunatic. It wasn't happenstance that their paths crossed that day. It was planned. And I'm telling you today, I did not know who was going to be here today, but God did. And it's not happenstance that you're sitting in a congregation today. That God is telling you, just like God appeared on the shore of that man. Jesus left, let me tell you, Jesus left a fantastic deliverance and healing crusade. He had ministered all day long. And those of you that know anything about ministering know it, know it is draining. I walk out of this pulpit every Sunday exhausted. Jesus Christ had done it from that morning. He had healed the demoniac. Well, he was God. Let me tell you what. When the woman with the issue of blood touched his body, he said, I felt virtue leave my body. Every time Jesus Christ, remember, he was a man. Just just as much as he was God, he was a man. And every time he ministered, virtue left his body. He had been ministering. The Bible says that he had cast out devils and healed as many as were sick. All day long. And at evening, the Bible said, he said, let's go to the other side. He got in the boat and he said, let's cross over. He left a deliverance and healing crusade. He jumped in a boat exhausted, physically wore out. He grabs a fisherman's blanket, rolls up at the stern of the ship, and goes to sleep. Because he's exhausted. But he's not done. I'm telling you how much God loves you. And then he faces the storm of the prince of the air. Let me tell you what. Everything you went through to get to church today, it was nothing more than the prince of the air trying to keep, trying to stop. You see, the enemy knew that there was a demoniac of Gadara. He also knew that Jesus was the son of the most high. And he saw The beginning and the end of this thing. He said, we got to put a stop to this. Jesus said, nothing doing. You know the story. Disciples come to him. Master, don't you care? We perish. Stands up, rubs his eyes. and Dr. Little says he stood on the bow of that ship and said, ah, shut up. And the wind and the waves. Then the disciples said, oh, wow. What manner of man is this? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. No sooner does his feet touch the ground when again he's diabolically accosted. All of this happened according to schedule. According to schedule. 
You see, this lunatic, this man that was possessed by past failures, I don't know when he was possessed, Brother Grant. Brother Lashley, I don't know what happened in this man's life to where he found himself in this predicament. But here he is. People had tried to help him just like people tried to help you and I. But his condition was beyond human understanding, much less their help. So they just tried to control collateral damage. They bound him. I know this man has gone through great difficulties. And I know that you've gone through great difficulties. I know that life was worse than death, worse than death to this man. I realized that pain and loneliness consumed his every waking moment. Talking to somebody today, whether you're born again of the Spirit or you have yet to come to that knowledge. That though life may go on and though the sun may arise in the morning on the inside, there's still this that holds you back. And I'm telling you today, God wants to set you free. It is not in my power. Let me just say that. I can't deliver you from a common head cold. But I'm telling you what, God can raise the dead. I can't deliver you from a bad habit. But God can deliver from addiction and possession. <laughs> Amen. Isn't that right, Sister Kathy? Hallelujah. So can you imagine his mo emotional status with me today? He wasn't completely crazy. You see, he had enough sense to come to Jesus. So that meant that he must be able to think somewhat rationally. Perhaps someone from Matthew chapter 4. Go back and read that right before the Beatitudes. The scripture says that they came from all over the, all over the area from Decapolis. And that's where he was from. Gadara was one of the cities, the ten cities of Decapolis. Perhaps somebody had witnessed to him about the power of this Jesus. We don't know. I'm certain nobody could truly empathize with this man's situation. And today, maybe nobody can truly empathize with where you are, what you've gone through, and what you're struggling with today. I am not equating here anyone to the demoniac, but some of us are held just as isolated and frustrated as this man was. Regardless the level of bondage that we go through, hopeless brothers and sisters is still hopeless. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, hopelessness parts. You see, the Apostle Paul was talking about a veil that was in front of the, of the Israelite nation that they couldn't see the glory of the Messiah. They couldn't see the truth of the living God. He said, but let me tell you what, when you'll turn to the Lord, this veil, this deception, this darkness will be taken away and the Spirit of the Lord will visit you. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. There's liberty from oppression. There's liberty from depression. There's liberty from oppression of any kind Jesus knew exactly where that man was and God knows where you are today he timed his arrival perfectly to intercept him and give him every opportunity to convert from wailing and worshiping in the tunes and mountains to prostrating himself and praising at the feet of Jesus what an opportunity Always, night and day, he had been worshiping pain, sorrow, suffering. But when he saw Jesus, he ran and worshiped him. He ran and worshiped him. Notice he didn't just come to Jesus. Scripture tells us that if we would come to the Lord, we must believe that he is. And he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. Come on. You see, we can bewail what's been done. And for how long? Or take advantage of an opportunity that's been given us to, by free choice of worship. The important factor wasn't his condition of life. It was his position of worship. 
Let me tell you today, it doesn't matter what you're facing. I don't know. I told you before, I can't help you. It doesn't matter what predicament has come your way or you've gotten yourself into. God knew that before he started calling you. God knew that before he started dealing with you. And let me tell you what, God loves you enough to step on the shore of your life and say, here I am, where are you? Ah, somebody hear me today. God loves you enough to step in the middle of your chaos, in the middle of your failure, in the middle of your problem and say, here I am. Come on. It's important to note that 6,000 demons... A legion's up to 6,000. 6,000 demons which inhabited this man could not keep him from coming to Jesus and worshiping. They could make him do a lot of things. But they couldn't keep him from the presence of Almighty God. If a legion of demonic forces were unable to stop this man's worship, certainly you and I can find our way into the presence of God if we but would. I said we could. I said, you can. I said, you can. Oh, pastor, I- I'm not worthy. We dealt with that before service, remember? Pastor, you don't know where. We dealt with that before we ever started today. So we could walk right into the presence of God. Come boldly before the throne of grace and find mercy and grace to help in the time of need. Come on. If you've already repented of it anywhere in this sermon today, you can lift your hands to heaven, stand up and begin to worship God, and God deliver you from whatever is harming you, from whatever is bound, binding you. It didn't take this tormented man long to realize that I've been in this condition way too long. Worship. Worshiping my affliction. It's only benefited me more of the same misery. Here is an opportunity to change my position in worship. Now, come on. Well, Pastor, uh, you know, God needs to come down and there needs to be a Shekinah glory of God. When God did away with the veil... There was no more need for the Shekinah glory of God to present itself. Now it's in the heart of men and women everywhere. The Shekinah glory of God represented his presence. And it dwelt above, between the cherubims. Come on. Now it dwells in the heart of men and women everywhere. And I'm telling you, the presence of God is in this room. I said, the Spirit of God is in this room. The healing, delivering power of God. How do you know that? Brother Lashley, Brother Grant, do you agree with me? Where two or three are gathered together in my name, and they agree in any one thing, he said, I'm in their midst and I'll do it. Now, I know I'm taking two different scriptures, but either one of them will work. Brother Ralph, you agree with me? Brother Kenny, you agree with me? Oh, come on. Hallelujah. <laughs> Come on. That means there's enough on that wing already. You're just so tuned up. Brother Matthewson, will you agree with me? Come on, there's three over here. Brother Ray, will you agree with me? Brother, Brother Elder Staten, will you agree with me? Bishop, will you agree with me? We got that side taken care of. Can I have three in the middle that will agree with me? Oh, I don't feel anything. I bet he didn't feel anything either until he began to worship. Ah, come on, there's power in your worship. There's power in your praise. Turn your worship away from what is bothering you, from what has you bound, and focus it upon the master. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, I've got another page and a half of notes, but I feel the Holy Ghost right now. Ah! 
God in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus in the name of Jesus come on let praise begin to echo out of your spirit come on let praise begin to echo up the corridors of the dungeon it seems that the enemy has you in set your affection set your worship upon God I worship you Jesus I worship you Jesus I worship you Jesus Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the spirit of worship, if I've been preaching to you, if the Holy Ghost has been dealing with you, and you feel, as it were, that thing that has held you back, and you want freedom, I don't have to pray for you. You just come and begin to worship Jesus. You come and begin to bless Jesus. He's the one that does the work. Hallelujah. Come on. Don't come expecting somebody to do something for you. You come to worship. You come to bless God. You come to lift Him up. You come to put Him first. Come on, and as you begin to worship Him, He'll set ambushments against the enemy. He will deliver. He will, come on. God's on your side. God is for you. Ah, yes, 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 yes. I worship you, Jesus. I praise you, Jesus. I bless your name, Jesus. Your grace will like the rain and it is desert. Hallelujah. Your light will be my night. Stood in sheet and draw. Your grace, your grace felt like the rain. This desert land, you have turned my morning into dancing. You have turned my sorrow into joy. You have turned my morning into dancing, and you have turned. Your grace felt like the rain Made this desert live Your light, your light Broke through my night Restored it, she joy Your grace, your grace Felt like the rain Made this desert live. Oh, you have turned One morning into dancing Oh